thank you very much indeed. It's really a great delight and honour to be with you this evening uh, to uh, spend an hour and a half talking about my favourite subject, which is sleep and circadian rhythms. Uh, as Mark was saying, um, there are two books that really cover much of the material that I'm going to be talking about uh, this evening. Uh, there's one which is a few years old on, circad on sleep and one that's now just over a year old on circadian rhythms. And this kind of looks like shameless advertising, um, and of course it is. Uh, but, but there is a, the, the paranoia of the author. You know, you wander into a bookshop, and many of you I know will have experienced this, and you see a great pile of your books, and you think, gosh, that's exciting. And then as you approach, you see they've all been reduced to 50p. So, um, <laughs> yes, there's a bit of shameless advertising. Um, what I thought we could cover this evening is a sort of a brief introduction, uh, then talk about the biology of sleep, and we'll touch on circadian rhythms, these 24-hour body clocks. Then the importance of light, which is often overlooked and is something that we have spent quite a bit of time studying. Then we get into the more sort of, I suppose, applied areas, which is sleep and circadian rhythm disruption. What are the consequences that uh, we may experience if we don't get enough sleep or we have disrupted sleep? Then the special case of teenagers. What is their problem? Um, LAUGHTER <clears throat> um, and I think we all have some idea. Um, mental illness, which I think is, is, a, is, is turning out to be an absolutely incredibly interesting area. You know, why is it that in so many areas of mental illness, whether it's schizophrenia or depression, do you have this concurrent um, disruption of sleep? What is, what's the link between these two really important domains of our health? And then... To finish on, well, what can we do as a society? What should an employer, what is an employer's responsibility to his shift work, um, uh, workers, for example? And then with a few slides right at the end, then what can we do as individuals to recognise whether we're not getting enough sleep and then perhaps one or two things that we can change in our environment. So that's the structure. And let's kick off with the introduction. And we will have time for questions uh, so we can hopefully explore some of these themes in a bit more detail. So these 24-hour body clocks, or these circadian clocks, these 24-hour clocks and sleep processes have captured the popular imagination. I mean, it's extraordinary. Over the past, I suppose, 20, 15, 20, 10 years that I've been banging on about this, it's transformed. And, 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 and whilst it's terrific, sometimes it isn't always helpful, and I thought I'd show you a nice example of this. So uh, you can look in the various red tops and, and see lots of discussion of sleep. Uh, but this was a, a recent uh, example. And this was from the Daily Mirror. And I was quite comfortable with this. Time to set your body clock. This is great. It would reach lots of people. And I, I worked quite uh, closely with Beth Gibbon and was very comfortable with natural rhythms rule our bodies and dictate the best times for a range of activities. And here's our countdown. Fantastic. Um, I have to say I was less comfortable with 10 a.m. Have a bikini wax. <laughs> <laughs> or, an, <laughs> or an injection or a visit to the dentist. Basically anything with the ouch factor. Pain intensity is at its lowest of teen age, says Professor Russell Wasner. Um, it's not entirely, entirely clear why, but it's probably because pain receptors aren't as alert as they are. What the hell does that mean as they are later? I promise you I didn't say that. Um, <laughs> and I certainly didn't say 6.30 p.m. heralds the start of two and a half hours of sex and booze. So, uh, look, sensitive to the time, if you're feeling a little frisky, um, <laughs> then you know what's going on. Um, okay. What all this nonsense is alluding to, though, is some truly awesome, extraordinary biology. And let's just start from first principles, which, of course, is we sit on this glorious blue sphere, which uh, rotates, um, and it, of course, means that we have a night-dark cycle. And, and this is so obvious, it's almost not worth talking about, but it's, it really is important, because it's more than just the day-night cycle. Our environment is radically different across the day-night cycle. So, for example, there are huge and obvious changes in, in light and dark and how our sensory systems have to adapt to those big changes. There's big changes in temperature. There's, in the natural world, huge changes in your risk of being eaten by something else. Um, and if you think about the states of, of sleep and activity, 
during activity, we're consuming food and we're, we're fueling our activity. But whilst we sleep, we're not taking in calories. So we have to mobilize those calories to allow us to live and, and metabolize through the sleep phase. So our biology, our, our metabolism is utterly different uh, in the rest-wake um, um, states. Our social interactions, so much of our behavior is guided by our social interactions. And of course, they're profoundly different across the day-night cycle. As I mentioned, sensory systems are very different, and indeed one's exposure to infections. If you're wandering through an environment where you're going to encounter other, other individuals and pathogens, um, then you're much more likely to get an infection at some times of the day than the other. And in fact, we see a big change in the immune system. And so what our biology has done is essentially adapt to these varying demands with, of, of, of this environment. So here we see a range of... 24-hour circadian rhythms, and in each case, we've got a 24-hour time base along here, and then a change on this axis, um, and the grey area represents roughly when we're asleep. And we can take one example, which is body temperature, and you see that body temperature is relatively high, but look, it drops in, in, in anticipation of sleep, and it rises in antici anticipation of activity. So there's some elements of energy conservation there, but you've got this internal change. And that's true for core body temperature, but for every other parameter you care to measure, whether it's blood pressure, whether it's our levels of alertness, and we'll look at these two in a bit more detail in a moment, growth hormone is almost exclusively released at night whilst we're asleep. And it's not just for growth, but it's for tissue repair. So a lot of the rebuilding of cellular damage during the day is, is occurring whilst we sleep at night. And if you don't get sleep, you produce very low levels of, of growth hormone. Uh, cortisol rises in anticipation of activity and um, so that once we're you know, awake, we can get out there and function uh, uh, in the new environment. And of course, the biggie, the most obvious of these 24-hour patterns is our sleep-wake. And that's what we're going to concentrate on this evening. And the point I'd like to make is what the circadian system, this body clock system is doing, is fine-tuning physiology and behavior to the varied yet profoundly uh, predictable demands of the 24-hour day. We're constantly adapting, tweaking to these, this varied environment. Let's have a look at some of the impact of this change in blood pressure and this change in alertness. Um, this is not trivial. So if we're lucky, you have sort of a 130 over 70 uh, blood pressure. But what's so very striking is that incredibly sharp rise that is partly clock-driven and partly activity-driven. But essentially here, you get this, this, this clock is, is saying, right, I'm going to increase blood uh, uh, pressure so I can get oxygen and food to all of those different organs for activity. And if we look at the frequency of stroke, here's time of day along here, and this is the frequency of stroke, and this is some work done by my colleague Peter Rothwell, we see this very sharp rise and that very sharp rise is between 6 a.m. and 12 noon. And there's a bas basically a 50% greater chance of having a stroke, an ischemic stroke, between 6 uh, a.m. and 12 noon than any other time of the day. Um, in fact, uh, this is one of the most dangerous windows uh, uh, for health generally. This, is, this is window is roughly when most people die of a var variety of different things. So it's worth bearing in mind. So when, when tomorrow um, you look at your wristwatch <coughs> and it's past 12, you can say, wow, I've survived at least theoretically the most dangerous part of the day. But what these data, of course, suggest uh, are two things. Firstly, when should we take our stroke medication? Most of us will take it sort of here, which is the most dangerous phase, when actually we need to take it here before that sharp rise in blood pressure. And at the moment, we're not very good at giving drugs which are, uh, are actually coinciding with when we need them most. And there's some very interesting research in this area. But also, what about our healthcare services? Knowing that the population is going to have a 50% greater chance of a stroke at that time of day, what can our ambulance crews and our hospital crews do to... Um, uh, optimize uh, medical interventions to try and mitigate some of those problems. And this is a good example of where time of days could have a big effect upon both medication and our healthcare services. And we can talk about that in the context of cancer and a whole range of other things.
The other one that I just wanted to illustrate to you is uh, the change in cognitive performance driven by the body clock. And what we've got here is a drop in our ability to process information on this axis and time of day along this axis. And so essentially throughout much of the day, we're, we're, we're okay. There's, there's, there can be a bit of a dip in the afternoon and, and that can be more pronounced in some people than others. But after around about 10 o'clock, there's a very rapid decline in our ability to process information. Then the clock um, uh, after about four to 6 a.m. kicks in and starts to get our cognition up again in anticipation of waking up and moving around our environment. Well, what you see here is a dotted line. And, and the significance of that dotted line is this is the level of impairment you get when you're legally drunk. When you've, so I think it's a 0.085 um, uh, alcohol in the blood. And what's so striking, of course, is that our ability to process information at 4 to 6 o'clock in the morning is worse than if we'd consumed sufficient alcohol to make us legally drunk. So if you take nothing from this talk other than the fact that if you happen to be driving a car at that time of the day, be incredibly careful because your ability to process information and respond to danger will be profoundly impaired, worse than if you were legally drunk. Um, and of course, no great surprise, accounting for traffic volume, this is indeed the most dangerous time of the, of, of the day to drive a car. This is when many fatal accidents are occurring. And we'll come back to that later on. But what I really want to focus upon is this extraordinary biology of sleep. And let's start to dissect it. Well, what we've got here is from statistics from the uh, American Time Use Survey, and it's for a large number of individuals uh, between 25 and 54, and they've got children. And what it does is divide up their activities. So about 37% of their activities are work-related, in including the commute to and from work. Then you've got leisure and sport, uh, household activities, uh, eating and drinking. It's actually quite a small percentage of our time. Um, uh, caring for others. Remember, these individuals have children. And there's a whole bunch of other. But look at this great segment here. On average, across the entire lifespan, we spend 36% of our entire lives asleep. At this age, it's about 32% uh, asleep. But what that represents is a huge and profound uh, behavior. And in fact, in terms of time spent, it's the single most important behavior we experience. And I really want to put that 36% into some sort of context. Now, anybody here about to celebrate their 60th wedding anniversary? Anybody? Yes? There's some people nodding sagely. I don't look young enough, sir, actually, to be even close. But uh, what I'd like to point out is that of those 60 years um, with your partner, uh, 21 and a half of those would have been asleep. <laughs> so, so whether you can take full credit, um, um, and I've, I've often wondered when I've attended these family events that I should take this sort of off and replace it with a, um, a 35, 38 and a half years, um, because that's actually the time you know, spent interacting. Um, but, but the serious point, uh, uh, and actually when you go to those, those events in the future, you can actually think of this slide. But, but the, serious event, the, the serious point is that the... The, the, the quality of this, uh, of, this, of this 21 and a half years of sleep will very much influence what's going on during those um, times interacting with others. It's also fascinating to think about how we view sleep now in our priorities and how sleep was portrayed and, and thought of in the pre-industrial era. If you think about so many of the plays and the sonnets of, of Shakespeare, they are littered with references to the importance of sleep. Enjoy the honey heavy dew of slumber. Um, o oh sleep, O oh gentle sleep, nature's soft nurse, how have I frighted thee? Just beautiful words, but all, you know, embracing the importance of sleep. And a contemporary of Shakespeare was a chap called Thomas Decker. And I think this is extraordinary because way back here in the 1500s, he was saying, sleep is the golden chain that ties our health and our bodies together. You know, they got it right four or five hundred years ago, and we seem to have um, forgotten the importance of sleep. And part of that has been driven by this extraordinary genius, genius which is Thomas Edison. Edison didn't invent the electric light bulb, but he commercialized it. He made it viable. And with this extraordinary uh, ability to shed light into a dark world, and uh, we were able to invade the night for the first time 
cheaply and safely. And from the sort of early 20th century, when, when electric lighting became more and more uh, important, we marginalized sleep. Sleep was the first victim. And it's fascinating. Edison's view of sleep was as follows. Sleep is a criminal waste of time <laughs> and a heritage from our cave days. And, and, and I think that that view dominated up until still recently, you know, or, or the 80s, people used to come into the office and say, I've, n I've done another all-nighter. And people used to slap them on the back and say, well done. And what I hope to convince you of, you should send them straight home because you don't want people who are sleep-deprived in the workspace. Okay, so let's look at this criminal waste of time and, and some of the biology of sleep. And the first thing I want to sort of stress is what are the critical processes occurring in the brain? Sleep has been so often viewed as this turning off, this downtime, where nothing important is happening. And, and I just want to change your view on this with just a few experiments. So here we have illustrated the sleep-wake cycle. And three critical processes going on whilst we sleep are the development and the laying down of memories, the processing of information, and indeed the way we view the world can be very much influenced by our state of sleep or our state of, of, of sleep deprivation. And let me give you two experimental bits of data. Information processing, and I love this study. This is by Jan Born's lab, and it was published now some time ago. And what he developed was a, a problem-solving task, and, and the, the details are unimportant. But he introduced it to one group in the morning, and then they performed it in the afternoon, and 20% of the group got the task. They solved the problem. The next group was introduced to the task in the morning, but then they performed it the following afternoon, but they were given no sleep. They were kept, kept up all night. And you see that 20% uh, solved the problem. Nicely controlling for fatigue. It wasn't just that these people were tired here, um, because they performed no worse than those people who just performed it in the afternoon. So it wasn't, it wasn't fatigue. The next group, which is, of course, the exciting one, introduced in the morning. They then performed it the following afternoon, but with sleep. And 60% got the task. And this is highly significant, and it makes the point that sleep promotes the ability to come up with novel solutions to complex problems. And we are, as a society, so dependent on our ability to solve problems these days, and yet we marginalize the most important cognitive enhancer we've got, which, of course, is sleep. Another really, I think, very interesting ex experiment was from Sickold's group, um, Walter Sickold. Uh, and he had a normal group, normally had normal sleep, and then another group who had been deprived of sleep one night. And what he asked them to do was to remember words with a different emotional content. So um, positive words uh, were joy, happiness, love. Negative words, hate, war, murder. And neutral words, which I went, actually went back to the paper because I couldn't remember what a neutral word was, but it's apparently things like cotton. I'm sure if you come from Lancashire, cotton isn't a neutral word, but anyway. Um, so, so what happens when you lump all of these uh, words together? Well, you see that the individuals who had uh, one night of no sleep, uh, there was a massive reduction in their ability to remember the words generally. But now let's divide it up on the basis of their, 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 their emotional content, if you like. Neutral words, there was a, certainly a trend. They were less effective at remembering those words, but it wasn't actually significant. Uh, negative words, it was even less effective. A trend, but it wasn't significant. And this is the data that I find extraordinary, is that the failure to remember positive words, love, joy, happiness, um, is massively attenuated compared to the negative words and the neutral words. So the salience, the amount of attention you give to negative stuff, is much, much greater when you're tired um, uh, than when you're fully, fully rested. So tired people have a negative focus, and we kind of would have, would have predicted that, but now there's the beautiful data to show it. In addition to sort of the brain processing information, there's a whole range of other things going on. The clearance of toxins and waste products has been a very interesting new area. And, for example, there was some, there's, there's increasingly strong evidence that one of these misfolded proteins, beta amyloid, which has been associated with the build-up within the brain and perhaps a causative agent in Alzheimer's and dementia, is much higher in individuals who are sleep-disrupted and sleep-deprived. 
I, I think one has to have some caution. I don't think that bad sleep will cause dementia. But if you're genetically predisposed and you've had a long history of sleep disruption, it could certainly nudge you further down that pathway. But certainly really important stuff going on whilst we sleep. And, and we could also say the, the, the brain regulating growth and repair, the replacing of energy reserves, and the rebuilding of all those metabolic pathways. So the point I kind of want to make in this first bit of the talk is that so much is going on within the brain, and so perhaps it's not so surprising that we spend so much of time asleep. And that should also, I suppose, tell us that this is very complicated. And what we now know is that the regulation of the sleep-wake cycle involves multiple brain structures, the hindbrain, the, the hypothalamus, the midbrain, and of course the whole of the cortex. It's, a, it's masses of brain structures. And furthermore, it's all of the key signaling pathways that are used by the brain. So the use of noradrenaline, dopamine, glutamate, all of that stuff, histamine, which is one of those key neurotransmitters that keep you awake. All of these are involved in the sleep-wake cycle, and we'll come back to this later on. The point I want to make is that sleep is a global brain event. It's, it, it encompasses much of the brain's biology. Now, in addition to all of that sort of neural circuitry, there are key regulators and drivers of the sleep-wake cycle. The first in our society is social timing. Um, it's, it's, it's being forced out of bed by an alarm clock. Um, there aren't that many really young people in the audience, but um, so, oh, <laughs> sorry, that was actually, that was very bad. There are many young faces that I can see. Oh, God, there are very many young faces. So, so who, who, who was woken up by an alarm clock this morning? Wow, that's, that's a lot. Yeah, we'll come back to you a lot later. Very bad. Um, uh, but clearly, the impact of an alarm clock can have a big distorting effect upon sleep duration and, and the whole sleep-wake cycle. Then there's a biological driver, and it's called the homeostatic drive, and it's the intuitive part about sleep, which is the longer you've been awake, the greater the build-up of sleep pressure, the greater the need for sleep. And the other biological driver, back again to our biological clock, this master clock, the circadian rhythms, which are essentially telling us now is the appropriate time to be awake, now is the appropriate time to be asleep. And it will also communicate with multiple clocks throughout the body to, again, align our biology to the light-dark cycle, and indeed the sleep-wake cycle. But to understand where sleep uh, can go wrong, we have to understand the interaction, particularly of these two biological processes. So let's look at these in a bit more detail. So here we have wake, and here we have sleep, and we're just looking at the homeostatic drive, and here's an increase in sleepiness along this axis. So during wake, from the moment you wake, the sleep pressure rises, and from the moment you sleep, sleep pressure dissipates. And that interacts with the biological clock. Oh yes, and that's, oh, I need that to remind me. One of, the, one of the processes that is building up here is a substance called adenosine. And what coffee, or caffeine in coffee does, is block the brain's receptors to detect adenosine. So a cup of coffee, or caffeine, makes you feel more awake because it's actually blocked the brain's perception of the build-up of this sleepiness drive. So that's why coffee does make you feel more awake. Now, this sleepiness drive um, interacts with the biological clock. And so from the moment we wake in the morning, the clock is saying, yep, you should be awake. Um, but you see the sleepiness drive uh, rises rapidly, but we don't fall asleep, usually, because the clock is keeping pace. As the sleepiness drive rises, so does the clock's drive for wakefulness. So at this time now, you're probably at your most sleepiest, but you're not, hopefully, falling asleep because the clock is saying, no, not ready to go to sleep yet. The clock then uh, approaches sleep and the, sleep, uh, the wakefulness drive declines. And then when you go into sleep, the wakefulness drive is very low. The sleepiness drive is really high. And so you fall asleep at this point here. And throughout the sleep episode, the wakefulness drive is low. But as you approach morning and wake, the wakefulness drive kicks in and you wake up at that point there. But what you see, of course, is this is where sleep is most likely. So if you happen to wake up during the first part of the night, 
it's easy to get back to sleep because the sleepiness drive is high, the wakefulness drive is low. If you, if you wake up sort of here for whatever reason, it's much more difficult to get uh, to sleep, back to sleep again because the, the sleepiness drive has, has declined and it may well be that the wakefulness drive is beginning to kick in. So, so that's why uh, these two systems uh, are important and why they interact. And of course, they're completely mixed up in, in shift workers and in jet lag because you're tired at the wrong time when your body clock is telling you you need to be asleep. It's, it's just a complete mess. These two oscillators are mixed up. I've talked a lot about circadian rhythms, but I haven't sort of told you where in the brain the master clock is located. So we've got here a brain, and these are the eyes, and these are the optic nerves, and they fuse here, and we can take a section through this part of the brain. And sitting just above where the optic nerves meet is a small structure called the suprachiasmatic nuclei, or the SCN, and it consists of about 50,000 cells. And each, and these yellow dots are the cells here, and each one of those cells is a clock. This is what's, I, I think, absolutely extraordinary. You can take one of those cells out, you can look at it in a dish, and it will show a 24-hour oscillation. So the clock is a subcellular molecular mechanism of genes and proteins which interact to form a 24-hour oscillation. And what we now know is that subtle changes in some of those genes can speed up the clock or slow down the clock, and there's a genetic basis for whether you're a morning person or an evening person, or, or, there's, there's a, or your morningness and eveningness can be influenced by your genetics. So you've got these 50,000 cells which are all working together to produce this master clock which aligns our internal biology to the outside world. Okay, so we've talked about the clock, and we've talked about all these other factors here. But for this clock to be of any use, it has to be set to the external world. And for that, it's the eye, and it's exclusively the eye, and I'll show you some evidence for that in a moment, which detects the light-dark cycle, sets those molecular clocks to the external world appropriately. Uh, and we'll talk about the eye in some detail. The eye, though, is also... Uh, sending projections into the brain, which also change levels of alertness. So the brighter the light, the more alert you are. In fact, if you get lots of light before you go to bed, it'll increase alertness and, reduce, and, and increase the time it takes to get to sleep. So, so it's one of the rules is to try and minimize light exposure before you go to bed. There's also the loop of the pineal this is an, and the production of melatonin. It is most emphatically not a sleep hormone. It has a mild, moderate effect upon sleep. It is a biological marker of the dark. It is always released during the dark. And it feeds back and probably onto the master clock and probably reinforces the light signal. But you'll often read it's the sleep hormone. It is ab absolutely not. Um, in, in about 70% of people, if they take three milligrams of melatonin before going to bed, it can reduce the time it takes to get to sleep a little bit. But it, isn't, it is not a, a major sedative. It is not a major uh, uh, agent. Now... What I've emphasized here is that you've got all of these interacting systems. An alarm clock, lots of coffee drinking can screw up the homeostatic drive. You've got your biological clock. You might be a morning person or an evening person. It may well be that you're getting an abnormal light-dark cycle, either regulating the clock or informing the brain, and you've got all these neurotransmitters and brain structures. And what this complexity means is that the sleep-wake systems are immensely vulnerable to disruption. And the sorts of disruptions that we see will have an impact upon our overall health, as we'll discuss later. Your cognitive health, your ability to process information. Your emotional and mental health, as we'll touch on later. And of course, all of these systems are interacting. So the point I'm trying to make is that the sleep-wake systems sit at the heart of really, really important biology... And they are also very vulnerable to disruption as a result of societal pressures or um, aspects of disease. Before we talk about sleep-wake disruption, I want to talk about the importance of light. So let's strip away all of these various components and just look at the way that the eye interacts with the clock. And we are able to measure rest activity patterns in individuals as a result of these little wristwatch devices. And they measured movement. They measure acceleration. And this is an individual who is, in fact, unemployed. Um, and you'll, you'll see this, this trace again later on when we, when we compare to the um, patients with schizophrenia. And this is midnight. And this individual is going to bed after midnight. And there's a fairly ragged 
get up and, and go to uh, are waking up. But it's a pretty stable rest activity profile on, on days. Uh, and you can see sleep onset and wake here nicely. Let's compare that with an individual who's tragically lost their eyes. They have no eyes, and you see that the clock is ticking, but it's drifting through time. Um, and we've got lots of records. We're doing a lot of work with individuals. In fact, we're working with um, the big charity, uh, Blind Veterans. Um, so, so it's definitely the eye that's regulating the clock. But we asked the question a few years ago now, is how does the eye do it? And this is sort of the textbook picture of the eye, and you know that light goes through, through the lens and hits the retina, and you have this layered structure of cells as illustrated here. And, and so light is coming from this direction, and we'll first of all talk about work in mice, then humans. And so, remember, light is passing through all these cells first. These are the visual cells, the rods and the cones. These are the inner retinal cells, and then these are the ganglion cells um, who integrate all the light information and then fire off the messages via the optic nerve into the brain. And we then started, oh, quite some time ago, looking at mice with genetic defects in their eye, such that the visual cells had largely degenerated. So these mice were visually blind. They, they couldn't respond to visual tasks. And we then asked, well, can they regulate their clock to the light-dark cycle? And they could. And they could with absolute precision. There was no change in their ability to regulate their clock to the light-dark cycle. And we thought, this is extraordinary. Um, and I was quite young when, I, when we first got these data. And, and we said, well, maybe there's another receptor system within the eye. And I remember presenting this at a meeting, big meeting in the States. And, and it was a similar sized audience to this. And I said, well, you know, maybe there's another receptor in the eye that we haven't discovered yet. And somebody at the back stood up, and, and I thought they were asking a question. And they looked at me, and they said, bullshit. Um, I just walked out. You know, we've been studying the eye for 150 years. Are you seriously telling us we've missed, missed an entire receptor system? Well, um, we had to do better experiments, of course, because it's theoretically possible that all you needed was these de terrible few degenerate cells that were left. Couldn't work for vision, but they might work to regulate the clock. So we then um, genetically engineered some mice where all the receptors were lost. And what was extraordinary is that these mice responded perfectly normally. When you covered up the eyes with little patches, this ability had gone. So there was something else in the eye. And what that something else was, was a small num number of photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. So those cells that form the optic nerve, about one out of every hundred is directly light sensitive, and it fires its projections into the brain and is regulating the suprachiasmatic nuclei. There's another light sensor within the eye. And we demonstrated this in mice, and then we're able to show that humans, we're just like mice. They are maximally sensitive to blue light, so the blue of a blue sky, and, and we can come back to that later on. Um, and the discovery that the eye is doing two very different things um, has had some big impact upon uh, 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 the clinical ophthalmology. So visual blindness need not be the loss of all light detection by the eye. So what's the impact of ocular diseases on human sleep-wake biology? So we've worked with my colleagues in the Oxford Eye Hospital, particularly with Susie Downs, who's a consultant there, looking at sleep-wake abnormalities in lots of different groups of patients with different eye diseases. And I won't show you all the data. That's another three hours. Um, uh, but I just want to summarize the data. And this is, I think, really important. There are two sorts of patient groups. Those individuals who've lost their rod and cone receptors, but have still retained their photoreceptors. Now, what you'll have throughout most eye departments in the, re in the rest of the world will be, sorry, you're blind, there's nothing more I can do for you. What the consultant needs to say is, look, you're visually blind, but you've still got these receptors, and what I would urge you to do is still seek out light, even though you can't perceive it, to make sure the clock is locked onto the external world. So you have an alarm clock or whatever it is, you make sure you go outside or you see light at the right time. And it gets even more frightening, actually, because there has been a tendency, it's rare, but it has occurred, where individuals who've become visually blind, they still have their eyes, but the, the sense has been, well, look, you know, you're blind, your eyes are no use to you, uh, you're going to damage them, they're going to be a source of infection, so why don't we just pop them out um, replace them with some prosthetics, 
because then it's so much easier for everybody. And of course, completely unwittingly, individuals have already lost their sense of space, but then they're deprived of their sense of time. The other group of patients that we're studying um, are those who, where diseases have affected the inner retina. The, the visual cells are there, but the inner retina has been lost, so there's no way that the visual cells can speak to the brain. And of course, you've also lost those ganglion cells. And these patients, uh, it, there's not a great deal one can do. You can try and consolidate with melatonin, and in some individuals, in the absence of any light signal, three milligrams of melatonin at bedtime, you know, the clock can just about stabilize to that. And that's worked, in fact, in some children. Um, but one of the big pushes at the moment, and I don't have time to go into it, is the development on new drugs um, based upon how light is interacting with the biological clock. And we're at a sighting stage, so we can, we can fool the brain into thinking it's seen light with these drugs. And that's looking really promising. And that's part of our collaboration with the Veterans uh, for the Blind. Okay, so the point is, clinical ophthalmology must appreciate that the eye provides us with our both a sense of space and our sense of time. And this potentially could affect at least 39 million people around the world who are profoundly blind and a further 285 million who are severely visually impaired. So this is a large number of individuals. How much light do we need? And it's complicated. So... Here's environmental light levels, and we're exposed to a huge dynamic range of light. So from moonlight, candlelight, sunset, and a mu museum's display case is around about 50 lux. Uh, office lighting is only three to 400 lux. Uh, near a window is 3,000 lux for most uh, spaces. Uh, light in, outdoors in the shade is 10,000 lux. And even in England, on a full sunny day, uh, I know they're rare, but we can get up to about 100,000 lux. So there's a huge dynamic range. The rods give us our sense of black and white vision and our sensitive down here. The cones are here. And so most domestic spaces, we can, of course, see color vision perfectly well. They can operate there. But what's important is that those photosensitive retinal ganglion cells need a lot of light. So they need light in the 1,000 lux range. But it is a bit more complicated because it's not just the intensity, but it's how long you get experience to that light. Um, it's wavelength, the color, the time of day, whether it's dawn versus dusk, the task, are you regulating the clock or are you regulating alertness, uh, how much time you spent outside, agricultural workers versus office workers, and indeed there's changes in sensitivity as we go from young people to old people. And I just want to give you some sense of, of the time of day is really important. So here we are. Here's the light-dark cycle, and this is activity. Um, uh, uh, well, this, let's, let's, let's call this sleep um, on, on these, uh, around about dusk and around about dawn. If you see light at dusk, it delays the clock. You'll get up later the next day. If you see light at dawn you advance the clock and you get up earlier. And one of the things that we've just found, we've just completed, actually published, uh, it's, it's to be published fairly, fairly soon, has been on students, university students. And um, we've, we've looked at them all over the world, and, and it's not light intensity, whether you're in Australia or Groningen in Holland or Oxford, that's the most important factor. It's how much time you spent outside at dusk um, that's the key factor. Most students are late they're going to bed late and getting up late because they're seeing lots of dusk light and they're not seeing very much dawn light. And so you can change morningness and eveningness a little bit with dusk light. And I just sort of want to emphasize the fact that, of course, we live inside a lot and so our light exposure is going to be changed. If we go outside, it's going to vary hugely. And, and, and the light uh, that we're exposed to is hugely complicated, and we're still struggling forward about what to do with artificial lighting. The point I want to just finish on in this, this area here is we may inadvertently make the problems of sleep disruption much, much worse by providing a very weak light-dark signal to the clock. And the classic example of this is in the nursing home environment. We said that you need several thousand lux for a really good way to set the clock. This is a nursing home at 20 past two in the afternoon, and these individuals are being exposed to 20 lux. I mean, m really very low light intensities. Um, and what my colleague Aus van Sommeren did from the Netherlands 
was to uh, look at the sleep-wake patterns of individuals before increasing the light in their environment. And you see, here's the light-dark cycle they're exposed to, which is about 1 to 200 lux on average. And it's a pretty ragged rest activity cycle. He then went in and installed bright lights, which were much more like uh, environmental light. And you see, look at this, a beautiful consolidation of the sleep-wake pattern. And critically, in those individuals where you saw a consolidation of sleep-wake, cognition went up very significantly. So a nice relationship between good sleep, uh, sleep disruption, and cognition in the elderly. We could make a big difference to levels of cognition, cognition and sleep-wake by getting the, the light right in these internal spaces. Oh, yes, and I, uh, I want to just talk about non-seasonal depression as well, because this is really quite interesting, and the use of light boxes. When these were introduced, I think we all got slight, we were slightly uneasy whether this was something important or not. But the data are now pretty good, and this is a paper published last year. So this is increasing levels of depression, so it's worse along here, in response to four different treatments. So, uh, sorry, this is, sorry I'm, I'm sorry, this is improved levels of depression, so you're getting better as you go down the scale here. This is the first group, which is a placebo. They thought they were getting a treatment, and there was some improvement. This is really interesting, because this is floxetine, which is one of the key antidepressants. And it was only statistically significant after about six to eight weeks. But this is light. This was uh, 10,000 lux, 30 minutes early in the morning, and you see it was much more effective than drugs at improving levels of depression. And what's also fascinating is that if you added the floxetine, the drug, with light, you got an additive effect. So there's something going on which we don't fully understand about the importance of light in depression. We'll come back to, to, to mental illness later. Okay, sleep and circadian rhythm disruption. Finally, I said what we've got here is immense complexity. And I just want to give you some examples here. So the short-term effects of sleep and circadian rhythm disruption, which we've all experienced, the loss of attention, high levels, high levels of microsleeps, the failure to process information. This is really important. Increased impulsivity. I can make the red light. Actually, you can't. Um, uh, loss of empathy. The failure to pick up the social signals in others. A negative focus, which we've already discussed. Memory impairment and increased mistakes. And it's really important to be aware that the tired brain is so tired, it can't perceive how tired it is. So it's really good at fooling itself. It's okay. But actually, in reality, it's not. And then, of course, as we've also discussed, reduced cognition and creativity. The longer-term health problems that you see um, in long-term night shift workers uh, is immune suppression. And it's this immune suppression that might be the basis for increased levels of infection and cancer. Some good data from night shift nurses from Denmark showing high rates of colorectal cancer and breast cancer. Increased cardiovascular disease, the risk of diabetes 2, metabolic problems, and increased stimulant and sedative use. And we'll touch on this. This can actually kick in um, with short-term uh, influences as well. And then finally, if you're sort of in the, the mental illness vul vulnerability domain, there's uh, uh, sleep disruption in uh, can in exacerbate mood instability, anxiety, paranoia, hallucinations, and indeed the symptoms of bipolar and schizophrenia. And we'll look at that in a little bit more detail now. In the USA, 100,000 crashes every year are related to sleepiness, people falling to sleep at the, on, on, at the wheel. Very tragic case, and these are those microsleeps. Very tragic case of the 2010 Air India Express. This is a chronically tired pilot. He was landing, and he just fell asleep, and the plane crashed. How do we know he fell asleep? Because you could hear him snoring in the, in the voice recorder in the cockpit. Um, this is a lovely example of the activity of the rested versus the tired brain. So this is fMRI, and, and basically where the, where the brain is lighting up during uh, mathematical tasks, performing mathematical tasks, in the fully rested state, after sleep deprivation, that's the level of activity. It's a beautiful illustration of how the brain is affected. And the problem is that tired brains then do this. They're woken up by the alarm clock, and then they fuel the waking day with stimulants. Caffeine, as we discussed, incredibly effective. The problem with caffeine um, is that it can stay in the body for very long periods of time. 
Nicotine, um, if you're a really naughty, tired brain, is a very effective stimulant. The problem is you're fueling the waking day with stimulants, and then there's a the tendency to use sedatives, um, either sleeping tablets or alcohol. But the key thing about this is that they are sedatives. They do not provide a biological mimic for sleep. Short-term use of sedatives can be quite useful in readjusting a sleep-wake cycle, but sustained use of sedatives to get you off to sleep can actually impair things like memory consolidation and the processing of information. So you, you wake from the alarm clock after a sedative-induced night, you need more stimulants and you need no, more sedatives. And we tend to think of this as being the, the pattern of many in the adult world, but what's so chilling is that it's increasingly the pattern if, of young children. Uh, I can tell you during the question time of some experiences in this, but you can even you can buy Red Bull in schools. In many schools, they're selling Red Bull um, and, and, and other caffeinated tablets. Kids are buying over-the-counter the antihistamines that can get through the blood-brain barrier like Phenagon. Has anybody here had Phenagon? Um, you don't have to, you don't have to tell me. Uh, but, I mean, I, I don't know how you, you found it, but, but it wiped me out. I mean, they, they can be very effective, and it's extraordinary. You can just buy them over the counter. And, of course, you're, you're, stealing, uh, you're stealing parental alcohol. Appetite can be profoundly affected by sleep. So under normal circumstances, the stomach release, releases the neurohormone ghrelin, goes to the brain, and it makes you feel hungry, and it makes you crave uh, carbohydrates. That's normally checked because the gut is producing the satiation hormone leptin, which is getting to the brain and making you feel full. And therefore, these two... And actually, this is a good example. This is me, actually, bef before and, and, and after <laughs> giving up chocolate hobnobs. I don't think there's any need to be quite so cruel in your laughter. Um, but <laughs> there we go. Anyway, the problem with sleep deprivation is that it hugely distorts this, this axis. And again, I can talk about some of the studies that have been done later. But, you, but tired people produce a lot more ghrelin, and they're predisposed to eat more carbohydrate in, uh, specifically. Um, and then we go to the final pathology. Sleep disruption has a big effect upon long-term stress hormone release. Short-term stress, really good. But when you're chronically tired, the only thing you can do is override this biological drive to go to sleep, is activate the stress axis, and that's associated with throwing glucose into the circulation, getting glucose um, uh, uh, intolerance, metabolic problems. Of course, you're, you're, you're increasing blood pressure, you're increasing heart rate. Um, and so you see all of this stuff that goes on in response to long-term activation of stress. And all of these pathologies are absolutely characteristic of long-term night shift workers. Before we look at um, uh, what to do about it, I just want to touch on teenagers. Um, delayed chronotype, this body clock type, and shortened sleep is a common feature in teenagers and young adults. And it's a really serious issue. Um, this is the sort of pattern of a good sleeper, whatever we term that to be. Here's the, here's the day night, and this is the period of sleep. And we see that this person is going to, to bed a bit later, you know, uh, uh, over the weekend. But they're fairly stable, and they're getting up a bit later at the, at the, uh, 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 on Saturday and Sunday morning. But what you typically see in many teenagers, not all, but many, is a pattern like this. They're going to bed really late. The alarm clock, of course, is driving them out of bed in the morning, so they're having significantly shortened sleep. They're massively oversleeping at the weekends. And then what you also find is that when they get home from school, they're having a nap. And what that nap of do is doing is pushing back the sleep pressure, meaning it's going to be more difficult to get to sleep at night. So there's a really interesting set of interactions here. Um, does it matter? Well, I think it does. Um, this is a very interesting study of, of, the, of the delayed chronotype, the delayed biology of teenagers versus actually their teachers. I don't know if there's any teachers in the audience, so I'm, I might be treading on thin ice here. But this is the, the, the um, uh, 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 essentially cognitive tasks that were performed mid-morning versus mid-afternoon in te teenagers, and they showed about a 10% increase. Their teachers went in the opposite direction. Uh, they started um, fine, and so they bounced into the classroom all ready to, to do the demanding things. But by the middle of the afternoon, they were falling asleep and the kids were bouncing off the walls. So there's actually, uh, there is an issue here. 
This is some data that we've, we've this is unpublished and we collected recently. And this shows, this is a, a measure of, of, of sleep efficiency. Um, and I won't bore you with the details, but this is on weekdays. The average is 85. Uh, sorry, the normal is about 85, and the average is about 85. So if you just looked at the average, you'd say, well, actually, there's no real problem here, uh, either on weekdays or indeed at the weekends. But the key thing to appreciate is that of this huge spread, about 35%, up to, in some cases 40% of these kids are getting really poor sleep. And so what we've done recently is just have an educational intervention. What we've uh, done and, uh, is, is to teach the teachers how to teach the importance of sleep and well-being. And it was eight half-hour um, sessions, which the teachers, uh, we gave the teachers tutorials, uh, dealt with the science of sleep, why is it important, um, what you can do to uh, influence your sleep, behavioural changes to make your sleep better, and also issues uh, associated with stress management. And the bottom line is, oh, and we also produced the parental leaflet, which so the parents would be more aware of the importance of sleep, and it covered things like how to make a sleep-friendly bedroom. And what was exciting is that um, this is the pre-intervention, just education. And remember, it's a total of four hours delivered by the teachers. And if you have a score below 16, then you have uh, essentially a diagnosis of clinical insomnia. And these are the kids who were poor sleepers. After the education, they actually moved out of that range on, on, on average. So it does show that we, it is extraordinary that 36% of our biology is sleep biology, and we're not arming our kids with any knowledge about how to optimize their sleep and tell them about some of the consequences of poor sleep. And I think there's, huge, there's a huge opportunity here whereby we can go into the schools and at least blunt some of the effects that we're seeing. And this is highly significant. Um, okay, to continue, Mark. Let's mark on. Yep, all right, jolly good. Okay, so mental illness. Um, greater than 80% of individuals with a psychiatric condition report sleep weight problems. This is a, a, a publication from 2011. Our work with the Department of Psychiatry in Oxford would suggest it's even higher than that. What's fascinating, and this is what got me into this some years ago now, is that Kraepelin had, had talked about sleep-wake disruption in patients with mental illness way back in the 1880s. But what was really interesting is that with the introduction of the, in the 1970s of the antipsychotics, people were quite, quite aware of the sleep-wake disruption in this patient group. But they said, oh, well, it's, 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 it's the, it's the antipsychotic medication. That's the cause of the sleep disruption, forgetting that for 100 years people had talked about sleep disruption in, in the pre-antipsychotic era. And what really got me into this was a discussion with a psychiatrist in a lift. Um, and, and he was basically saying that the abnormal sleep you get in schizophrenia in this case is simply because these individuals don't have a job. And he at, this is his quote, my patients don't hold down a job, so no wonder they get up late, miss my clinic, and don't have friends. And I, and I thought that was unbelievably crass. So we decided to look um, at how bad sleep-wake is in individuals with a diagnosis of schizophrenia. And I won't show you all the data, but I do want to show you the patterns. Here's the one you saw earlier. Here's our unemployed individual. And you know, they're going to bed a bit late, and it's a bit wobbly. But this is the range of patterns we got with individuals with schizophrenia. This was the best. So here's midnight. So much of the activity is occurring after midnight. This individual was just drifting through time. They, they were normally sighted. We don't know what was going on with these individuals. This individual was sort of basically hanging on, drifting, and then fell apart completely. Then you have this incredible fragmentation. And then this individual had no 24-hour pattern at all. These rhythms weren't just bad. These are utterly smashed. And it was those observations, followed by understanding the neuroscience of sleep, wake of, of sleep and wake, that made us think about a new way of thinking about this problem, which is that sleep disruption and mental illness share overlapping brain circuits and neurotransmitters. Remember, the, the sleep-wake systems are using all the key neurotransmitters. So if you have a change in the neurotransmitter pathway that predisposes you to mental illness, it's almost certainly going to have an effect upon sleep in parallel. 
Now, clearly, the sleep, so, so you will be predisposed to have mental illness and sleep disruption. But it can be made worse because the sleep disruption, by its global effects upon our biology, its distorting effects on biology, can exacerbate the mental health severity. And, of course, the mental health condition can exacerbate the sleep problems. But this is all terribly easy to test. So, we made a set of predictions. And the first was, genes linked to mental illness will also affect sleep and clocks. So we took genes that have been linked to human schizophrenia, changed those gene in, genes in a mouse, and then asked the question, what's happened to the sleep-wake pattern of the mouse? And many of the genes that have been linked to human schizophrenia also disrupt sleep-wake in a mouse. So good evidence for a genuine overlapping pathways there. Furthermore, we've been able to show that some of these new clock genes that have been discovered are linked to certain mental health states as well. So there is clear evidence for this component here. And furthermore, if the mental illness isn't simply causing the sleep disruption and there is an overlap, then we might see sleep disruption before any clinical diagnosis of a mental illness. So again, working with Guy Goodwin, you can identify individuals who are at high risk versus low risk of developing bipolar conditions. And what we see is that in the low risk kids, there's a nice sleep wake pattern, but in the high risk kids, you're already beginning to see a disruption of that beautiful sleep wake profile. So, so there's again evidence for that overlap. And then finally, what about this leap loop here? And this is the most exciting. What happens if we can partially stabilize sleep, dis sleep wake disruption? Do we have an effect upon the, um, the severity of the mental illness? And so that was the experiment. And what we were able to do was partially stabilize sleep wake in a group of individuals. These are the control groups at 0, 10, and 22 weeks. They didn't have a sleep intervention. And these, the, 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 uh, the experimental group had sleep restoration and we halved the levels of paranoia. And that also um, had the same effect upon hallucinatory experiences. So yes, indeed, we can think of sleep as a potential therapeutic target to reduce some of the severity of the symptoms for psychiatric disease. It's early days, but I think there's enormous hope there. Finally, what to do? Uh, are we okay to go on for another? Oh, we're all right, okay, great. Uh, sorry, I, I, said, I said to Mark I'd take slides out, and I think I ended up putting more in. I, um, so what can we do to help individuals who are suffering sleep disruption? And I want to tackle this as both as a sort of a societal level, what an employer can do, and then what we might want to do as individuals. First of all, chronotype individuals. And what I mean by this is that there are morning types and evening types. And if you have night shift workers, it would make an awful lot of sense to match the body clock type to the type of shift. So, we've talked about larks versus owls, and we said there's a genetic component, there's an age component, and it depends upon natural light exposure. But this is the distribution of morning types and evening types throughout the population. You see, there's a big spread here. And so, the difference between when you want to get out of bed, biologically, versus when you're forced to get out of bed by an alarm clock is called social jet lag. And the greater the social jet lag, the greater the chance of poor health, obesity and diabetes too, worse mood, sleepiness, fatigue, increased risk of smoking and alcohol consumption. And, and this is work, I should say, by my, my friend and colleague in, in Munich, Till Ronneberg. And look at this for heart disease. For each hour of social jet lag, the difference between when you want to get out of bed versus when you're forced out of bed, bed uh, is associated with an 11% increase in the likelihood of disease. So, for goodness sake, an owl on the morning shift will suffer hugely compared to a lark. It's a greater distance, greater social jet lag. So why don't we? I mean, we're not going to put the 24-7 society back in its bottle. Night shift work is here to stay. But what we could do is offer, as a possibility, a chronotype test and say, OK, you guys will be best suited to the morning shift. You will be ideally suited to the day shift. And you will be ideally suited to the night shift. Now, clearly, we wouldn't force this. But a very simple test could be done to try and optimize your body clock with the demands of when you need to work. High frequency health check checks. What we've talked about 
is uh, uh, the, the importance of catching, well, we haven't talked about this yet, but what we've talked about is, is that um, you have increased cardiovascular disease, cancer, obesity, all these sorts of things, and in night shift workers. So why the heck are we not screening for these conditions early in this particularly vulnerable group? And why it's so important is we just look at the statistics for cancer. Um, early stage, you can catch cancer. There's almost 100 There's certainly a, a greater than 90% chance of actually living for, for five years. Late stage, you're dropping in colorectal cancer to 12%, prostate 29%. So vulnerable individuals should have higher frequency health checks. And that's something that we should, I think, insist upon. Technology to help vigilance. This is a, a very chilling statistic. These are junior doctors who've had either an accident driving home or a near miss driving home. 57% re reported a, an accident or a near miss. Um, and in fact, in, in Oxford last year, we lost one of our, our um, uh, junior doctors. She, she crashed on the way home after the night shift. Um, why the hell aren't we using these things? Uh, you can buy them in the high-end German cars. They detect the face, and they detect if you're falling asleep, and they tell you that you're falling asleep, and they're very good. They work. Um, so, so I feel that there's a duty of care by an employer to provide such d devices if you're driving home on the night shift. Um, and it's easy, simple technology that we have here now. Appropriate nutrition. This is... This is also leaves me aghast. Shift workers, we've seen these lists before. What food do we give to night shift workers on the night shift? It couldn't be worse. It's, it's fast food, high fat, high sugar. And what we should be providing them is, 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 is much more nutritious, easy to digest food. And, it's, and it's, I don't understand why Marks and Spencer's hasn't produced a whole range of night shift work food. You, you know, small, high protein, um, low fat, low sugar, that would uh, at least mitigate some of the problems you're seeing here. Sleep education, we touched on that within the context of children, but I think it's really important that we, that we let our workforce know of some of the impact and the, and, and the problems of doing night shift work. Um, and why? Uh, because, and it's not just the workers, it's the, it's, it's the parental, uh, the, the, sorry, the fam f family group. And here's a chilling statistic. For night shift couples with children under 19 years, the risk of divorce uh, increased up to six times when one of the spouses worked between midnight and 8 a.m. as compared to daytime hours. And, and, you know, that loss of empathy, that change in behavior that you see after tiredness, we've got to let the partners know that this is likely to happen. And it's not that these people have become bad, it's just one of the biological consequences of working on the night shift. What can we do as individuals? Well, the first question is, how much sleep do I need? Um, and insufficient sleep is suggested by the following. I think there are some confusing messages out there. You know, there's this idea that we all have to have eight hours of sleep. That's, I think, misleading. What you need to do is work out what your sleep priorities are and your sleep needs are for you. And, and, and so, first of all, you need to address, well, um, do I, am I dependent upon an alarm or a person to wake me up? And, and about what probably 40% of the audience have already admitted that they're not getting enough sleep. Um, does it take a long time to wake up? Do you have that real sleep inertia, that sluggishness? Um, do you oversleep hugely at the weekend, and particularly on holidays? How does your sleep pattern change when you're not forced to get up at the same time? Do you seek out stimulants? I think it's extraordinary. I'd love to get the statistics on, on the rise of night shift workers, uh, the night shift work and, and, and the, the number of Starbucks and Costas. Um, do you need these stimulants to, to, to sustain wakefulness during the day? Uh, do you desire or do you take a nap uh, during the day? Do you sense a loss of empathy, an increased irritability, either in yourself or are others reporting it about you? Increased impulsivity and risk-taking. This is really characteristic. You know, as I said, jumping that, that, that red light or just doing stupid, unreflective things. Mood swings, again, noted by you or others. And again, uh, the failure to concentrate and, or process information. These are all things that you can ask yourself. And what do you do? Well, you have to develop a good sleeping environment. And rem this is my last slide. So, so it's all right. Um, removing distractions from the sleeping space, get rid of the televisions, the computers, turn the internet off, put the internet on a timer for goodness sake. 
Keep the sleep space dark, not too warm and quiet. Um, I think I should get a, get a, a sort of a retainer fee for John Lewis for, for, for recommending their blackout curtains. They really work very well. You, you sort of line them, uh, normal curtains, with those, and they work spectacularly well. Actually, and this is kind of obvious, invest in a comfortable bed and mattress and pillows. Make the sleeping space a, a, a place, a haven for sleep. Get rid of all of the other crap. Um, try to maintain a consistent bedtime and wake time. Don't oversleep at weekends. Go to bed early if you can on a work day. Adopt a regular routine that you find particularly relaxing, such as reading or listening to music prior to sleep. And if you cannot cope with your bed partner snoring, and I actually I had a slide uh, like this once before, and it said, if you cannot cope with your bed partner snoring, find an alternative. And there was a space, and everybody said, an alternative partner. <laughs> it wasn't. That was the reverse. It was a find an alternative sleep space. This does not reflect upon your relationship. Um, and then the final, well, the penultimate bit of information, limiting stimulation before you go to bed. Minimize light exposure 30 minutes before the desired bedtime and keep the lights low in the sleeping space. I, yeah, I think it's extraordinary. What's the last thing that most of us do before we go to bed? We stand in the most brightly lit room in the house, looking into an illuminated mirror, cleaning our teeth. That increase in light will increase levels of alertness and delay sleep onset. Eat at the same time. As we've discussed, avoid caffeinated drinks in the afternoon and certainly not before sleep. Avoid the use of alcohol or other sedatives to induce sleep. It's okay to do it acutely from time to time. It's where you depend upon that as your normal routine. Engage in regular physical exercise, but not, with four hours, but not within four hours of going to sleep. There was some really interesting controversial stuff there. There was a study which said, yes, morning exercise, really good for consolidating sleep. And another study said morning exercise had no effect. The difference between the two studies was that one group exercised outside and was exposed to the morning light, whereas the other did so in a gym. So if you're going to exercise, exercise outside. That's where the data are supporting. Avoid stressful situations before sleep. My wife always wants to discuss the bank account before we go to bed. I said, no, 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 in the morning. I really don't want to know how poor we are. Um, and then avoid napping. We may want to explore this, as we talked about, long naps, delay sleep onset at night, it's a real problem with teenagers, a 20 minute nap is okay, but, but really be careful you don't slide into that longer and longer naps, later and later bedtimes, you're tired, you need, you know, it's, it, can be, it can become a bit of a problem. And of course, finally, getting the right daylight exposure. Ideally, morning light is the most useful at setting the clock. If you're a morning type, which are rare, uh, then evening light could help you get up a bit later. Okay. I'm sorry, I've horribly overrun. Well, I've, 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 it's taken just over an hour, so it's not that bad. Um, what I wanted to give you some sense of was sort of just, I, I suppose, uh, the, way, the contradiction between the way we think about the importance of sleep now and, and the pre-industrial era. Talk about the biology of sleep and this interesting set of interactions, and it, it's immensely co complicated. And also talk about the importance of light and how we should be thinking more about light as the way it affects our sleep-wake patterns. Understanding this biology can help us understand the nature of sleep and circadian rhythm disruption. And then we talked specifically about teenagers, mental illness, and then we touched on at the end what we can do potentially as individuals. And with that, I'd like to finish, and thank you for your attention. There he is. I couldn't see him. <laughs> Sleep behind you. Russell, uh, um, thank you so much. Such a lot to, to take in. I'm worried now that my, I'll have thoughts rushing through my brain all night to try and digest all of this. That's all right. Go to um, a quiet place, listen to some music. <laughs> thank you. Um, we do have some microphones for questions. I'm sure you'll have lots of things you wanted to ask. A few people did send in questions beforehand, some of which you've addressed, this question of do we need eight hours sleep. Yeah. Um, and um, specifically, um, obviously, lots of us do struggle with sleep from time to time. And, of course, this is great, really good advice on sleep hygiene and practical things we can do. But when we get into that situation where we really are struggling to sleep, and I know this can become a self-fulfilling prophecy, yes. you, you're worried about sleeping. It's not just about have you turned the light off, but actually you're, you're feeling anxious about sleep. Yeah. 
Um, first of all, is there any advice for that more insomniac-style way yeah. of being? But also, one of the questions that came in was, we know that taking long-term sedatives or sleep medication isn't necessarily helpful, but what about things like antihistamines? Mm. Can yeah. they be helpful for short-term? What, yeah. what are your views on that? Well, it's very interesting because, I, I, in fact, I was talking to one of my colleagues who's the head of a department in, in Oxford, and he was describing that his sleep had just completely fallen apart. And he said he had fantastic sleep, and then he had a whole bunch of grant stuff, and it started falling apart. And what was, that was telling me is that it's not the sleep that's the problem is the stress management. And so there are really important ways in which mindfulness, for example, and other stress management techniques can, can actually alleviate some of the key problems that we think are sleep problems. They're not sleep problems, they're stress management problems, and they knock on and have an effect. So, um, what, I mean, and a lot of individuals go to their GP and they say, I've got a sleep problem, and the response is, well, here's some sedatives. Um, and I think, yes, short-term sedative use can be useful. Uh, but, it's, but it's where it becomes the way you sed you're sedating yourself every night. Um, I think we've all, including myself, taken the antihistamine because, you know, uh, after jet lag or something like that. But be really careful. It doesn't become a habit. And also be aware of what you're doing the next day. I mean, Fenegan, I mean, the gentleman down here. I mean, I, <laughs> I had read about Fenegan, and so I thought, well, I'll give it a go, um, as you do. Um, and so I took him on a Friday night. And I seriously was wiped out for the, for the next, half of the next day. And I'm very sensitive, therefore, to these antihistamines. And if I'd have had to drive a car or operate machinery or do something cognitive, it would have been extremely foolish to have done that. And so, you know, think of the context. So, yes, the occasional correction, and some people use it for jet lag, but be intensely careful about what you do. I mean, it, it also amazes me that so many people on long-haul aircrafts sedate themselves with alcohol. They get off in Florida or wherever, and then they hire a car, yeah. and they're drunk. And, and again, the, there's an interesting duty of care. You know, should the, um, should the steward or stewardess say, can I just check you're not driving when we land? Yeah. Um, and then I'm happy to give you... I mean, we don't do this type of thing. But on, on that subject of, of um, airlines, one of the other questions that came in was about, back to your idea of shift work, in particular about cabin crew. Yeah. And, and you know, yeah. it's really difficult in certain patterns, as you said, you just are constantly disrupted. You talked about the employer's yeah. duty of care, but what about an individual that has really no choice but to work in a disruptive pattern? Is there anything they can do that really well, helps? Well, I think, I think this is the, the, the key issue because for economic reasons, for many women, for many, uh, you know, they do night shift nursing because it's the only way to have a career and maintain a family. So, you know, it's getting this, the kids off to bed, they go on the night shift, they get back, then they get the kids off to school. And it's no good saying you shouldn't do night shift work. That's, it's, it's, a, it's an unfortunate and economic consequence. But knowing that you're more vulnerable to, to, to cancer, metabolic abnormalities, they should be screened and, and you should look for them. Uh, and, we can st and, and getting the appropriate nutrition, being really careful about what you eat and when you eat it. So this is the sort of stuff that I think we should be introducing. Um, and what you also find is that some people are much better at it than others, and that's because of their chronotype. Yeah. So again, I think there's things we can do. It's, it's not going to take it away, but it will blunt some of the severity of the, uh, of the issues. Thank you. Now, can I see a show of hands? Who'd like to ask for, uh, Professor Foster a question? So let's Please, start with uh, the gentleman down here. Rus Russell. Russell. Uh, thanks, Fiona. Yeah. And then, can I see, let's go to this gentleman over here afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you mentioned sleep duration and yeah. the myth of eight hours. Yeah. Um, it seems to me, reading a lot of the research, that in fact eight hours does seem to be physically optimal and cognitively optimal. Um, so, so the question, it, sorry, yeah. is how much sleep is good yeah. and how do you get it? Okay. I think that's really important, but what, what I've become slightly uneasy about is the mantra of eight hours, because, but, because there is a huge amount of individual variation. Um, and people can, I mean, so, so I gave a talk recently to Public Health England, and I had a health care worker who came up to me afterwards and said, I'm really worried. I, I'm doing all I possibly can to make sure all of my doctors are getting eight hours of sleep, and we're, and we're not achieving it. Um, and so there was this obsession with eight hours. Rather than saying, okay, right, how much do I need? You know, and, and working out empirically and prioritizing for yourself about how much you need. Some people genuinely need nine. Other people can probably get away with about six. It's unlikely you can get away comfortably with, le with less than six. And in fact, the, the, the National Sleep Foundation guidelines will say eight hours, but some people will need up to nine and a half, and some people can get away with six. So I think what's, what sort of 
happened is that we've just latched onto eight rather than, and, and, and as being the way we, we have to have eight rather than this, as I say, saying how much do I need and what are my, what are my sleep um, requirements and, and then prioritizing. I mean, it's really quite interesting. M morning times, if asked, does your work life interfere with your preferred sleep times? They say, no, it's just wonderful. Um, and then ask the question, does your social life interfere with your preferred sleep times? They say, it's absolutely awful. I want to go to bed early on a Friday night and all my mates you know, are dragging me out. Um, and so there's different tensions in different groups and there is that variation across society and we need to be aware of it and use it where we can constructively. Thank you, let's come over here. Question. Who's got the microphone? Yeah, thank you. I just want to thank you. I just wanted to ask, um, uh, what, what, what did you, can you tell us a little more about the studies, uh, the gym studies? One, one of them found that uh, exercise yeah. in the morning. Um, I don't have all the details to hand. I'm happy to try and look those up. Um, but I know that, that there was this, the, 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 again, the mantra was absolutely exercise. Um, and, and the big study had got people to exercise outside. I can't remember what the exercise was, whether it was running or some other exercise, but they did it outside and they got a big effect at sleep-wake stabilization. And what happened is that people tended to go to bed earlier and therefore got up earlier. Um, and then another study looked at exercise and it wasn't outside and it had no effect at all. Um, and, and actually, it's, it's, the variation is, it, also this, there's going to be variation, because unless you chronotype people in the study, so, so there are studies also saying there's no effect of shift work on health, but, but unless you chronotype whether they're morning types and evening types and the amount of social jet lag, the noise that you get in the study is, is, is so highly variable that it doesn't make sense. So, so again, we need to be conscious of that variation. Let's see hands again. So we'll come a bit further back in the room. Let's take this lady in the pink top here. And uh, thanks, Fiona. And then, can you wander around and take that question right in the back row over there afterwards? Thank you. Hello, and thank you very much for a really useful talk. Um, I, I work with families, and I come across many children who are born poor sleepers. Yes. Do you think that over the generations we're using, losing the ability to fall asleep naturally and easily? I think it's a really good question, and I think there are changes in um, societal expectations. I think many of us from my generation grew up, and there was a bedtime, and it didn't change. You went to bed, and the naughtiest thing you could possibly do was read a book under the bedclothes. Um, now, bedrooms, and particularly teenage bedrooms, are places of entertainment. Um, and I think that we could perhaps, this is not necessarily the most popular response, but I do think we could be a bit more disciplined as parents. It doesn't go down well and you have the kids saying, and I've experienced it myself, yes, but all my other friends can have a television in, the, in, my, in their bedroom and, and all the rest of it. But part of, I think, the failure for parental guidance is that we as a society haven't given the appropriate advice. You know, it's just not there. And um, I think we should start to get the information out and, and get some authoritative voice. And, and what I've been, Mark and I were discussing this earlier, perhaps what we need to do is persuade government to have a, an authoritative website where the experts in the area do a q and I mean, I, I, I'm a, I, I do a lot of work for the Royal Society. And before any public policy documents that we produced, we first engage with the broader public, finding out what the questions are that they're interested in, what their misapprehensions are, what the confusions are, and then the policy is then informed by the public debate. And perhaps at sessions like this, we could start to get those sort of key questions and then contact the, 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 the key researchers and then get some clear statements and authoritative statements out there where we can guide, I think, parental attitudes. So I think, I think there's, there's, there's a change in the way we, we bring up our children. We're just much more relaxed, and, and for obvious and wonderful reasons. Um, there's also data, though, suggesting that exposure to the light-dark cycle when you're young. So there's, there's one or two studies suggesting that neonatal, kids in a neonatal, um, preterm kids in a neonatal wing, and, and like intensive care, there's constant light. If you expose these, these children to a light-dark cycle, they develop stable sleep-wake rhythms earlier. What the long-term um, sleep wake is, is, is like in those individuals, we simply haven't any idea. And it raises another issue about, about what's happening with sleep. So, so, for example, in those kids we've been looking at, those with the poor sleep, 
What's their long-term educational trajectory or health trajectory? We simply don't know. And I think we've got to get sort of long-term sleep studies, studying the... And it's, and it's crazy, it's such a shame, because there are these long-term, longitudinal studies, but sleep has never been considered as an important um, parameter to measure. But I think things are changing. Yeah. Thank you, and then there's a lady at the back as well. Hi. Hello. Where um, Wait, oh, there you are. Yeah. Hi, thanks for your talk. Um, so interesting, because I work in the field of chronic pain. So, um, oh. yeah, so sort of particularly interested in terms of the sort of overlap in brain circuits and neurotransmitters yeah. related to mental health, and I think you could almost add a third bracket on there in terms of chronic pain. It's well, and, of course, neurodegenerative disease. Yeah. I mean, I didn't touch on Alzheimer's, dementia, you know, and, and where, in fact, a change in the pattern of sleep-wake precedes um, uh, all of those conditions as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's so closely linked with people's pain uh, flare-ups. It's always a, a massive yep. thing, and I see it in such a lot of patients. And rightly so, it's being dressed more and more in sort of... So. And, and, of course, the interesting thing there is, is that if you're sleep-deprived, you're changing the immune response, and, of course, that'll change some of the inflammatory and, therefore, the pain responses. So, again, you've got that incredible set of connections. Absolutely. And I suppose my question is, to sort of pull it back to the clinical stuff, is if you're working with somebody to try and improve their sleep, how... Often the, sort of the, the tendency, certainly from patients, is, oh, I've tried that, it's not working. How much yeah. time do we need to be investing in people to give them some time and space to actually yeah. start to make long-term changes? Uh, 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 the short answer is we don't really know, because we, we, we've got... There are some programmes that are coming online which are cognitive... Cognitive behavioural therapy. And so you can have cognitive behavioural therapy one-on-one -on -one with a, an appropriately qualified individual. And that's been shown to stabilise sleep-wake. Perhaps some of the interesting things coming on are the online versions of CBT. There's a, there's a programme called Sleepio, which is one of my colleagues in Oxford has developed. And I was, I was sort of talking to some friends and colleagues who have been using it, and they said, yeah, it's, it's great, but you really have to stick with it. I think what we've got to do is get the message out there that you that you're not simply the slave of your sleep. There are behavioural things that you can do to make it better. And, and while, we're, while I've, I'm sort of on this sort of soapbox, um, uh, we, we start to sort of talk about the apps that you could possibly use. Now, in theory, an app, whether it's an app, I, iPhone, or whether it's a, a, a Fitbit or whatever, could be really useful. As, as Mark and I were discussing earlier, if you want to lose weight... Um, you change your behaviour and you weigh yourself in the morning, you see a change in weight and that acts as a positive reinforcement. So in that way, those, those devices could be really useful. But they are, in many cases, misleading. Um, you know, they, they report to give you a sense of how much deep sleep or slow sleep, slow wave sleep you've got, and they simply can't do it effectively. Um, and so I think you can use them as a broad guideline, and you can use them and say, well, actually, I did get more sleep last night, but don't do anything more than sleep duration. Um, so, y yep, people need to know that they have to stick at it, they, but they can take, take control. And one of the ways they can take, get some objective measures are these apps, but don't take the apps too seriously. Just use them when do they get up and when do they go to bed. I think that really feeds into this idea of eight hours as well. So sometimes we see people and they've almost got themselves so worked up about the idea I, I of, of uh, having this yeah. eight hours, the app's not right, and I actually know. we're just trying to let them almost let go a little bit and try and relax into this, yeah. what is quite a natural... I, I kid you not, I, I, I met a young chap uh, at a talk uh, fairly recently and he came up to me afterwards when people had sort of gone away and he said, do you believe in slow-wave sleep? And I said... Yeah. Um, he said, well, I'm not getting, any, getting anything. Uh, do, you know, am I going to die? And this was as a result of, of this. And there's so much misinformation there. And we're so, you know, as a, as a society, poorly educated in this sector. We've got to empower people with this aspect of their behaviour. Your, you. your reference of the apps, of course, also raises this other point about the always-on... Th thank you for a great question. The, yeah. the, the always-on culture and the use of devices. And we yeah. had an event with uh, Laura Willis here on on use of devices and how they're sort of taking over our lives. And when it came to sleep, there was a very interesting point made. I mean, actually, let's do this now. How many of you here have a mobile phone that you charge in your bedroom at any point in time, honestly? Okay, that's kind of bonkers, isn't it? And, and I, when, I, when, we, when we asked, and I'm the same, when we asked people why that was, most of them said, well, it's my alarm clock, it's how I wake up. Yeah. And of course, actually, you know, traditional alarm clocks still exist. And when I actually did make a shift to 
charging my phone outside of the bedroom yeah. had a huge impact on it. So I'm just wondering, are there any other little simple tips like that that we can build in? Another one I was told, which I've tried and quite enjoyed, is set an alarm to go to bed as well as oh, set an alarm yeah, to wake up. That's a really a good idea. I, 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 so what, what are the other little simple I nudges mean, we can use like that? I, I think there's, there's a whole winding down, you know, minimising light exposure, but doing something relaxing. I absolutely do not read scientific papers in bed. <laughs> I, I, I read tr trashy, you know, crime novels, um, light touch, you know, Agatha Christie type stuff, because it's comforting and it's sort of, you know, easy. Um, and uh, the room is dim, uh, and uh, so it's just getting in the right space. There's no televisions, there's no computers. Um, it's, it's a haven for... And actually, I know it's sort of... It's almost like crystal waving, and, I, and I, I, I'm sort of... Things like particular smells that you, that you find relaxing. Fine, use lavender. If it works for you, use it. We don't know what the mechanism is, and it may be placebo. But if it works, then use it. It's important. Thank you. We've, we've sort of hit our time. We say we'd like to wrap this up at 8.30. Um, are there any other final pressing questions that we desperately wanted to ask? Let's take one from Vanessa, and then I think we'll have to wrap up because we've got to let people go away. But I'm sure Russell will be happy to stay and answer a few more yeah, questions after the event yeah. as well. So let's just take one over here, and then we'll... We've got a couple of a final announcements to make at the end as well. Brilliant um, talk, Russell. Thank you. Just a really simple question. Is it true that an hour before midnight is ah. worth two after? <laughs> That's a great question, and I'm not completely sure, but what the biology would suggest is that what you've got in the first half of the sleep episode is lots of deep sleep. And what we're thinking now is that deep sleep is part of memory consolidation and the processing of information, whereas REM sleep is more emotional processing and, and there's less deep sleep. So if you agree with that, um, that, that the first half of the sleep episode is, you know, restorative, deeper sleep, then it kind of makes sense. Um, but, 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 but there's very little good evidence for it. Yeah, so, so it sort of fits with the biology broadly, but, but we've got no really clear studies. Well, no, because what happens there is the biological clock is very much influencing the different sleep states. So, so what will happen is the clock will keep on ticking. You've missed the deep sleep window, and then you'll, then you'll, you'll move out of that window. So you, you, you can get compensatory sleep the next day. So what people have done, which is very cruel, they've actually you know, monitored people using EEG. They've waited till they get into deep sleep and then woken them up. <laughs> Boy, if somebody did that to me, I'd bop them. Anyway, um, and, and then the next night, they went into deep sleep for longer. So, so it's really interesting because it seems to be genuinely defended, um, but it's still more concentrated at the first half of the night than the second half of the night. Um, I mean, you know, we thought we knew where, what REM sleep was all about, you know, this rapid eye movement sleep. And it was that's when we, you know, dream sleep. And we thought, oh, that's memory console. It doesn't seem to be. It, the, the, I think the sort of consensus now is that it's probably emotional processing. But, but it's, I mean, it's, it's, it, what's so fascinating is that people, neuroscientists up until recently, have not gone into the area of sleep. No serious neuroscientist would you know, you wouldn't ruin your career on something as ridiculous as sleep. I mean, it's extraordinary. And, and people warn me off this whole area. Um, and, but now we're getting some extraordinary neuroscientists coming in, and actually from other disciplines as well. So we're beginning to get those basic biological questions. I mean, one of the slightly frustrating things for me has been that we've studied sleep in the clinical realm with EEG for 50, 60 years. What's it actually taught us about the mechanisms of sleep? Well, bugger all. Um, and so I think until we, you know, but it's the, the, the emerging new biology that we sort of touched on this evening, I think is going to increase and there's lots more people coming to the field. So some of the questions that many of you have asked, we'll, be, we'll have better data for it to answer. So we'll have to get you back um, in future years to share yeah, the latest ten years time. Um, I'm going to have a couple of announcements, but before we do that, please join me in giving a very big thank you to Robert Foster. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.